Okay, we're in the book of Exodus tonight, if you will. Book of Exodus, chapter 30, chapter 30, and we're reading verses 17 through 21. For those of you here for the first time, and uh, just want you to know we've been in uh, a study now, this is I think our third, fourth week, studying the Old Testament tabernacle, the meeting place for worship that God gave to the children of Israel after they'd come out of Egypt, they're traveling in the wilderness, and God gave Moses instructions uh, following the Ten Commandments as to how to construct this portable house of worship. They just, every time God said move, they moved, they packed it all up. And I want you to know this was thousands of pounds worth of material. And some they loaded on wagons, others they had to carry on poles on their shoulders as they walked across the wilderness to the next place where God would tell them to stop and settle down for a while. And you can appreciate the fact they had to move fairly often because there's not a lot in the desert. And when you've got two to three million people at this point, and you don't have sky rises, right? They're, they're all spread out, 12 square miles of people, somebody's estimated, moving across the desert. Uh, it was no little thing. And uh, I, can, I hate to think about some of the complexities of that. Like, where do you go to the bathroom, right? And, you know, if, if Mike's in front of me and I got to walk, that way, I'm going to step pretty carefully. But there were things they had to go out and bury it and all those types of things. But you can imagine just the, the difficulty of all of that journeying. We sometimes look at them and say, why were they always grumbling and complaining? How many of you think if that was you and I out there in the wilderness, you might hear a little grumbling and complaining? Okay, it's hot, it's dusty, it's a lot of things, smelly, everything. And they were going through that. So we're studying this house of worship, a portable house of worship, and something that they could pack up and move and set up again and have to come and worship God at. And we know that one of the greatest things about that was that God adorned it with his glorious Shekinah glory, his presence there within the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. We've been seeing that that tabernacle is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. In so many different ways, it's a, it's a picture, it's a prophecy, uh, it's a type, it's, it's a symbolism of him and what he's done for us. And when I say that, let me just say, last time we were together, we were talking about the brazen altar. So when you approach this house of worship, there was a large fence around the outside of it, uh, 150 feet by, by 75 feet, and, and then there was a gate there that was 30 feet wide. And when you had to come through the gate, which was a lot of bronze around that, and then right inside the gate, there was this brazen altar made of bronze. Some people say it was really copper, but uh, I'll just use the word bronze or brass. It's easier. And uh, uh, that speaks of Christ who suffered the judgment for our sins on the cross of Calvary, the shedding of his blood. He was the lamb, as we talked this morning slain for us from before the foundations of the world and took upon himself the burning wrath of God against my sin and yours. He suffered for us. And so we rejoice in that. Tonight, we're coming to that next article of furniture that you would have approached. As a matter of fact, you wouldn't approach it at all. You got as far as the altar. You got, if you will, to the symbol of the cross where Christ died and then at that point, only the priest could go, all right? So nobody else got to go beyond this point to the laver. And somebody said to me tonight, what in the world is the laver? I said, well, you listen good tonight, and hopefully by the time we're done, you'll know exactly what it was. But we'll be talking about this laver. And uh, it speaks, and I'll just tell you up front, it speaks of Christ, our sanctification, which is the setting apart of the believer to live a holy life to God. And uh, our lesson tonight will fully explain that, at least I hope it will fully explain that for you. Now let's read the passage here, in beginning in verse 17, Exodus chapter 30. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, 
You shall also make a laver of bronze, with its base also of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. For Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it. When they go into the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water, lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, lest they die. And it shall be a statute forever to them, to him and to his descendants throughout their generations. Let's bow in prayer, shall we? Father, thank you tonight for your glorious word. And Lord, we might just in our devotions maybe read through this passage and not give much thought at all to this labor. So I pray tonight you'd help us, help me, to as simply as possible explain the function of the labor and its relationship not just to the Israelites in the Old Testament, but Lord, to us today, here tonight at Devon Park Baptist Church. Lord, minister your grace in our midst. Teach us more about this glorious salvation that you have provided for us and your intention for the way we should live our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. I want to talk for a moment about the materials that were in this, this laver, what it was made of. And if it's a brazen laver, it's made out of what? It's made out of bronze. And a mixture of copper and tin is what I understand that to be. And we saw in the last message that bronze, from which the altar of sacrifice, the burnt, burnt sacrifice were made on, was made of bronze. And bronze is a picture in the scriptures of judgment, the outpouring of judgment. God's judgment was poured out on that altar, if you will, symbolizing Christ, his his wrath being poured out on the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and him taking this punishment for my sin and for yours. What's interesting here is where they got the bronze for this laver that they built. And if you go over to chapter 38 here of Leviticus, chapter 38, and you come down to verse 8, and it says here, and he made the laver of bronze and its base of bronze from, what did he make it from? From the bronze mirrors of the serving women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So there were women that were there serving and helping uh, with, with ministry. We don't know exactly what they did, but they were there to serve. And they had these looking glasses. Now, this will sound sexist, but who would you expect to have looking glasses, Right? <laughs> I'm sorry, Carla. She's going to going to get me about this afterwards, right? The women had these mirrors. Why? What do you use a mirror for? You look at your appearance, and if your hair's messed up, you comb your hair, or you know, if your makeup smudged, you you, you kind of fix that. And and if you got you know breakfast on your teeth, you kind of clean that off your teeth. And you see that when you look in the mirror. That was what they had them for. So when when you look at this. And you realize that they got these, the brass for this from the women. How many of you think that was quite a sacrifice? I think it was. I mean, they valued these mirrors. They, they didn't have glass mirrors like we do. They would take this, this brass and they do is just polish it and polish it until it's so shiny. They could look at it and see the reflection. They kind of know what they look like and what they needed to fix and, and all of that type of things. And uh, they had all these mirrors. And you can imagine the interesting thing here, I don't know how many mirrors it would have taken because it doesn't tell us what the size of this thing was. We're never told the measurements. The only other part of the furniture that was in the tabernacle, we don't get its measurements, was the candelabra. It doesn't really tell us how large, how tall, how big that was. When it came to the, the bronze altar, we said it was seven feet by seven feet, about four feet high. The measurements are there in the scripture, so many cubits and, and so on. We know that, but we don't know what size this bronze labor was. And I'll tell you up front, so you'll understand it when we come to it, I think that's intentional. 
Because God's saying the limitations for this brazen altar, this brazen labor rather, is limitless. It's limitless. And you'll appreciate that when we begin to understand what the labor's purpose was. Now, you could look in the mirror and you could see how beautiful you were, or you could see how beautiful you weren't, I guess. Somebody has said this, beauty skin deep, but ugly goes all the way to the bone. Beauty fades, but ugly holds its own. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, these ladies had these mirrors, and they were willing to donate them for the building of the labor and, and gave them of a willing heart to the Lord. Now, one of the things I think is a parallel lesson here for us, one of the things that can happen if you spend too much time looking in the mirror, you're either going to get real depressed, right, as you see yourself getting older like me, or the other side of that is a lot of people look in the mirror and they're filled with what? They're filled with pride. They're filled with pride because, wow, look at me, and oh, my hair is just so, you know, I, I, I look so beautiful and all of that. And, uh, you know, probably if you considered all the money that's spent in the city of Fredericton, after people look at mirrors, <laughs> of running to get a haircut, of putting on the makeup and everything that goes with it, right? All the stuff for the lips and the eyes and all of that, millions and millions of dollars are spent on makeup and fine clothes and everything so we can look in a mirror and say, wow, I'm ready to go out and have people see me because I look good. And uh, I don't think that God's upset that we want to look good when we go out. I think he might be upset if our purpose is to just draw attention to ourselves. I think if, if our purpose, you know, uh, I, I don't think it violates God's commands uh, to be dressed in modest apparel. If it doesn't violate that, then it's okay. Do your hair and, and some of these things. But the whole thought here is, the Scripture tells pretty clearly, don't be so focused on the outward appearance. There's something more that's more important, and that's what, the inner man of the heart. Now listen, when these women took their mirrors... And they're willing to say, here, take them and make this brazen labor. What were they saying? They were saying, we realize that the spiritual thing is more important than the outward appearance. We're willing to give up our mirrors in order that this labor can be made to be used in the service of God and uh, the glorious purpose that God had for it. And so I think it did represent a real sacrifice on their part. I think they're to be commended. Uh, that they willingly gave up of their mirrors and put the spiritual uh, first in their lives. Now, what's interesting also is that this laver here, which was really just a large wash basin, how big we don't know. Was it seven feet across? We don't know. We don't even know what it looked like. If you look at drawings of it, you'll always see they're always different. Even the ancient Jewish rabbis say, we don't know what it looked like. We don't know how large it was. Some had the idea that there was this uh, a, a big upper basin and then a, a, a sort of a footstool that was on the bottom that they would come and rest their feet on as they, they washed. And others say that there were spigots coming out of that, little taps that could be turned off and on because in order to properly wash themselves, it had to be running water. And so the water would come down out of the first basin and then there was another basin underneath. Some say what they did is they washed their hands in the upper basin, they washed their feet in the lower basin. We really honestly don't know, and I'm just telling you the truth about that. What we do know, it was used for what? It was used for cleansing, it was used for washing. That was the purpose of the labor. And you can imagine, if you're a priest, <laughs> and you've been out there cutting throats, sheep and oxen, and there's what? Going everywhere. There's blood, and I dare say this, blood and guts, <laughs> everywhere. So as they sacrifice these animals and, and put them on the altar and so on. And then they're going to go into the tabernacle to minister to God, but they dare not go in there until they had first what? Washed themselves properly at this labor for cleansing and received the cleansing at the labor. And that all has significance, I believe, for our own lives. Now, that labor that was there for cleansing, becomes a real symbol of the Word of God. In James chapter 1, verse 22, it says this, But be ye doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. 
For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man, beholding his natural face in a what? In a mirror. Now remember, they made this labor out of this bronze mirrors, and I get the idea that it was probably polished highly because everything else in the tabernacle was done extremely well so that if you looked in the laver, if you didn't see your reflection in the water, you might see it in the, the bronze itself. And uh, so he says, he's like a man beholding his natural face in a mirror, for be, he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and immediately forgetteth what manner of man he was. In other words, didn't pay any attention to what he saw, just kept in his direction. I walk up, I look in the mirror, I look down, I see this sticking out there, and I just ignore that and go to the fridge and get another bowl of ice cream, right? I just ignore what it showed me, what it revealed me. And uh, the, the Bible does that for you. Have you found that? It shows you the different areas of your life where you're not what you ought to be, and it, it steps on our toes. It slaps us kind of up the back of the head once in a while. It tells us we need to smarten up. So this labor here, made out of these looking glasses, reminds us of the Word of God, and uh, it speaks of washing, but it speaks also of judgment, because it's made uh, from these mirrors, and the mirrors what? They reveal us. They reveal the things that God doesn't like, that God's going to judge in our lives. If we're Christians, we saw a couple of weeks ago that that means some chastisement's going to come our way, right? And especially if we see things and we don't deal with that. Now, we're taught in the Scriptures in, Hebrew, or in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that if we judge ourselves, we wouldn't have to be judged. If we look in the mirror and we allow it to judge ourselves and we deal with that sin, then we don't have to worry about the chastisement of God coming on our lives. But if we ignore that and go our way and we don't bother to get cleansed as we look into this labor, as we come to it, the labor of the Word of God, then the, the chastening is going to be part and parcel of our lives. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so the Word of God reveals us. It, it shows us what we are. It judges us, if you will. But also the Word of God cleanses us, doesn't it? We, we know there's an initial cleansing that Titus talks about, the washing of regeneration by the Word of God. Now, the word that's used there is a full bath. It's two different words from a, the, the washing and the labor to the full bath that you receive from God when you trust Him as your Savior. There's a cleansing. My sins are what? They're gone. I have been cleansed by Jesus Christ. I only get that once. But we're going to see that there's a daily cleansing that needs to take place in our lives, right? And that's the cleansing that's pictured here, I believe, in the labor. In, uh, just, just listen to this verse. Uh, Exodus chapter 30, verse 18, talks about putting the water into the basin there. And so you've got the water added. And water itself, just to throw this in, is also a picture of judgment. Just think of Noah's day. God judged the world with what? With the flood, with the water that came. And then water is not only a picture of judgment, it's a picture of cleansing in our lives, just like the Word of God. And then we read in Ephesians 5.20, the Bible speaks of Christ and His church says that He might sanctify it, Right? Make it holy, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it, that is the church, with what? The washing of water by the word of God. The word is what? It's the water that cleanses. He judges us, shows us what's wrong, and then he cleanses us through the word of God if we heed it and follow it. And so Jesus' will for us is that we be sanctified, that we, we judge the sin that's in our lives, and that we lead clean lives. And we only are able to do that through the water of the word that's been given to us by the Spirit of God. John 15, 3 says, now ye are clean through the what? You're clean through the word. If you want to be clean, wherewithal, Psalm 119, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. So the word, the cleansing, the washing of water and the labor are all a picture of of the cleansing of God. And then, of course, we know John 17, 17, Jesus was praying for his disciples. We've studied this in prayer meeting for the last six or seven weeks. He says, Lord, sanctify them through the truth. Your word is truth. It's what makes them holy. It's what cleanses them, Lord, so they are what I want them to be. Psalm 17, 4 says, by the word of thy lips, I have, I have kept me from the, the paths that destroy. 
the word of God keeps me from following the paths that destroy, that defile me and keep me unfit for serving the Lord. So when you put it all together, the altar that's made of brass stands for judgment, filled with water stands for cleansing, so we can escape that judgment that, that could rightly come upon us. Christ is the one that took our judgment. Christ is the one that cleanses us. He is. Listen to, to 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, Christ is made unto us, what? Wisdom and sanctification and righteousness. That's, he's made unto us. This is who he is. So the picture of Christ is clearly laid out here in the scripture for us. Now, I want to go back and just talk about the position, the placement, if you will, of this labor. You come in, you can't come to God except there's been a what? A sacrifice. You need a Savior that's going to cleanse you from sin. So you come to the brazen altar. But once you come to that brazen altar and made your sacrifice, then you needed something. You needed a priest. <laughs> the priest offered the sacrifice, and then the priest had to go where? To the labor for the washing and the cleansing. And that's all significant for us. We're going to see some interesting things. At least I think they're interesting about that, that God wants to teach us uh, uh, about this. We come to God. We find reconciliation. But then we have to come to this labor. Why? Because we discover something. It was kind of a shock to me. i got to tell you this. I thought when I trusted Christ as my Savior, I would never do something again. How many of you thought that? Right? You were sure, I'm going to trust him as my Savior. I'll never sin again. And I couldn't believe it the first time those words came out of my mouth, the first time I got angry and got in a fight with one of my brothers, because I thought that was over and done with. But there it was. Now, if I died at that moment, where would I have gone? I'd have gone to heaven because I've got the bath from Jesus. But as long as I allow those things to remain in my life, I'm going to be out of fellowship with Jesus, not out of relationship. I'm still his child because if I receive Christ, I'm in the family of God, but I'm out of fellowship with him. I'm not going to be in good fellowship with God. How many of you think being in fellowship with God is kind of important? If you're a believer, believe me, that's a, a, a big thing in your life. And so we want to be in fellowship with him. Who can approach under the hill of the Lord but him that has what? Clean hands. Clean hands. Where do you get clean hands? You've got to go with the labor. What's the labor picture of? The word of God. So when I preach Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, I say, get in the word. Read your Bibles every day of life. Why? Because you need to wash your hands every day. You need to wash your hands every day. Now, I'm going to tell a little story on Gracie. She was away for the weekend, and she came back and sat down at the table with us, and Mary looked over and looked at her hands. She said, Gracie, go wash your hands. She had black under her fingernails, and Joanna's there eating with us, and she says, uh, Gracie, did you get a bath this weekend? No. Well, she said, I had one on Friday. It's only Sunday. You know what? Some Christians live their lives that way. They come on Sunday and get a little washing, and then they what? They go all week long and don't take the spiritual bath of being in the Word of God and receiving the cleansing that's in there. Washing of the hands and the feet. And what happens if I don't take a bath for a week? Nobody wants to get real close, I'll guarantee you that, right? We begin to stink. Can I tell you something? If you don't take your washing, not the big bath, right, but the little washings that we need every day, what happens sooner or later? You stink. You stink to your fellow Christians, and you stink to the lost out there in the world because we allow sin just to kind of creep in and creep in and defile us. And we wonder why nobody wants to listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're looking here at these truths. We're looking at, at the, the labor. And the reason I said it's round is the, the very word for labor there is a word that means round. So we have a feeling this was a, 
a round wash basin, I think rather large, probably seven, eight feet. Maybe it was bigger than that. We really don't know. We do know later on that it held gallons and gallons of water, so it was pretty good size. But uh, it, w it was round with a stand of some kind on the bottom of it and uh, with, I think, probably spigots that came out. So they turned on the running water and they could be cleansed. And uh, so the picture we have of the tabernacle, I don't want to belabor this, but I want you to get it. You have a sinner like me approaching the tabernacle of a holy God. How would you feel about that, Bob? You're not saved at this point. <laughs> You're a what? You're a sinner approaching God. Any apprehension there? A lot of apprehension about approaching God. But you come and you make your sacrifice and you learn this glorious truth that there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are what? In Christ Jesus. He's our sacrifice. And then... Is it over? You offered your sacrifice. The animal's been slain. No, that's not all that God wants out of us. And I'm going to say again, they had to have a priest in the Old Testament days that would offer the sacrifice and then would go to the labor and get the cleansing. And he's representing us before God, right? And then God before us. In the Old Testament, ordinary people like you and me, we couldn't go into the presence of God. But the good news of the gospel is what? You don't need a priest today. You have one, and his name is Jesus. He's your great high priest. But beyond that, this is a precious doctrine. I don't think we value it like we ought to. The Bible says that we are believer priests. Priest Kevin Boyd. Next time you see him, just call him priest. Priest Bob Dunlop. Priest Jeremy Head, Priest Joel Dean, right? We're, we're believer priests before God, and, and I think it's a precious doctrine. Let, let me just give you a couple of scriptures. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6 says that God has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. We've been made priests. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Listen, you, just, you don't just have a priest, you are a priest. Now, what was, what's so important about that, that you're a priest? Because being a priest means that you have access to come into the very presence of God. Do you know the reason that you can pray and talk to God is you have access, purchased by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, but you've been made a priest, so you have that right to come into God's glorious presence and be there with him. You know what? I have people come all the time and say, would you pray for me? Yes, I'll pray for you. I pray for a lot of you every week by name. But I want you to understand, everybody here that's a believer in Jesus Christ can pray for you. We are believer priests, can take other people. Listen, even better, you can take yourself into the presence of God through prayer and talk with him. He's given us access into his presence. It's a glorious thing. But there's something else that just... I was thinking about this afternoon when I was running over my notes that a priest didn't just have access to God. The priest offered sacrifices to God. <clears throat> so if I'm a believer priest, I get to make offerings to God too. And you say, well, well what kind of sacrifice do I make, make before God? Well, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says this, you are built up and holy priesthood, listen, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by God. Jesus Christ. Now realize this, the only reason you get to do this is because of Jesus Christ. But you get to offer up, not a physical sacrifice. I'm so glad, aren't you? Wouldn't it be a great job for your janitor here and we're slack, sacrificing goats up here on, on an altar every Sunday and the blood's pouring out all over the place? I know for sure they get this carpet out of here. It'd be a mess. That's not the kind. He says spiritual sacrifices. Well, what kind of sacrifices do we offer to God? Well, Romans 12, 1 says that I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your what? Your bodies, a living, what? Sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. It's well-pleasing in God's sight if you'll offer your body. And what's the symbolism of that? When God's got your body, he's got all of you. All of you, and that's what he wants. He demands all of us to to give ourselves and present ourselves to him. 
Philippians chapter 4, verse 18, Paul's talking about the, the believers that had sent him a gift, monetary gift, or whether it was a physical type of gift of some kind, but they'd sent Paul a gift, and he'd received it from Epaphroditus. He says the things that were sent from you, and notice what he calls their gift. He says, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. When, when you give to help out the work of God, when you commit to a faith promise, offering to God, when you put money in the offering plate to support the work of the church here, when you gave the gifts that you gave to your pastors a week ago for, for pastor appreciation, that's a sacrifice that's what? It's acceptable and well-pleasing to God. And we thank you for that, by the way. It meant a lot to us to be remembered and, and to be thought in that way. Uh, we, I, I was reading some articles a couple of weeks ago that, that most churches are doing away with pastor appreciation. But I want you to know we appreciate that. We need it sometimes, just a little word of encouragement, a little note, anything to encourage us along the way. When you bring your tithes and offerings and put them in the offering plate, it's, what? it's a sacrifice well-pleasing to God. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 says, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. That's why it's so important what Jeremy and the other people that are on the praise teams do. Well, they help us to offer the sacrifice of praise to God from our lips. And it's what? It's well-pleasing to God. We're just, they're helping us to be the kind of priests we ought to be. That's why I don't understand. Somebody could be a believer and sit here and stand here, and we're singing praises to God, and their lips never move. Open your mouth. You're a believer priest. You owe it to God to lift up his name and to praise God and to shout his praises in this place. Every believer ought to be singing in our services when we gather together. Here's another one, Romans 15, 16. I just want to turn to my Bible and look this one up. Romans 15, 16 says this that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ. In other words, I'm a priest offering, right? I'm ministering. That I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, listen, that the offering of the Gentiles. Now remember, Paul was the minister to who? The Gentiles. That's who he'd been sent by God to preach the gospel to. And what he's saying here is that I get to make an offering to God of people that I preach the word of God to, and they've accepted Christ as their Savior. When somebody gets saved in this church, when you talk to somebody out in their home, and they bow their head and pray and receive Christ as their Savior, what's that become? It's an offering that you can bring and offer to God. A sacrifice acceptable to him. He says that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable sanctified by the Holy Spirit of God. I can't encourage you enough that every one of us is called to be a soul winner. We're called to be witnesses to those that are lost, to tell them what God has done to us, to tell them this precious gospel of Christ, how that he suffered and died for their sin. He offers them forgiveness, wants them to come in repentance and faith to him and allow the Spirit of God to draw them to himself. That's a, that's a whole lot, isn't it? But when we win people to Christ, that's my love offering to God, to see people. And we get to rejoice in it, but God rejoices in these sacrifices that we make unto him. But the believer not only, or the, the, the laver not only talks about the believer in our new position as a priest, but it, it talks to us about this new problem that I alluded to a moment ago. And that is the problem that, yes, I've had my bath, my sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ, but every day of life, those priests laboring in the tabernacle, this thing cost millions of dollars, by the way, but it didn't have any floor. So as those priests ministered around the, the altar, there was the blood and the sand and, I don't know, there's clay, what else is out there in the wilderness? I'd never been there myself. But that got mixed together, and you're walking around in that stuff. Your feet got what? It got dirty. Some of it got on your hands. You got dirty. And so you're making a mess of all of this. And 
There was a need that's pointed out here in our lives. When we hear things like the shooting that took place today, when we walk down the trail and we hear the young people with the F word coming out of their mouths with every step they take, we live in a world that's dirty. And it's easy to get what? Defiled. Walking in a dirty old world. The words get in our minds. They can assail us. The, the dirt of this world in which we live clings to us. And we need a daily cleansing at the laver of the Word of God. And the problem we have, we got a great position, we're priests, but the problem we have is, listen carefully, you can't minister in the tabernacle itself, in the holy place, and especially in the holy of holies, but, but even in the holy place, with what? With dirty hands and dirty feet. There's a need for cleansing. What's that say to us today? If you're going to minister on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you need? You need clean hands. You need clean feet. You're just fooling yourself. And listen, the Bible says that there are those believers that don't have a ministry of life, they have a ministry of death. When a Sunday school teacher with dirty hands and dirty feet and maybe a dirty mouth teaches a Sunday school class, you know what generally happens to that class? Death takes place. Because the kids can see. <laughs> maybe nobody else does. You can put on a smiley face, but what? Death clings there. Death is the scent of death is in that place. When you're out there and you're living like the world and you're, and I've seen this, I've seen Christians, well, you need to get saved. And then the next thing I hear is a string of oaths come out of somebody's mouth. Nobody's going to get saved with that. You just ministered death, not life. You've ministered death. And so what's God calling us to? He's telling us if we're going to minister on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need clean hands. We need holy lives. We need to walk before him in cleanliness. And you have that startling discovery that even though you're a believer, what still creeps into your life? Sin. Sin. 1 John 1, 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we're what? You're just a great big liar. <laughs> you're deceiving yourself. You're just deceiving yourself because we have sin. That's why he says in the very next verse, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to do what? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to forgive us. So what? We can get back into the business of ministering on behalf of Christ with clean hands and clean feet before the Lord. God longs for that in our lives. 1 John 2, 1 says, These things have been written unto you that you, what? That you sin not. I don't want you to sin. I want you to be clean. And he's told us, when you do sin, there's a way to be clean because we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, that does what? He's doing a work of cleansing on us. And we need a daily cleansing before the Lord. We've had a cleansing from the penalty of sin, but we need a daily cleansing from the defilement of sin and the practice of sin. Let's face it, how many of you here are practicers of sin? I got to confess, I do it. I, I lose my temper, I do this, I do that. I say things when I think afterwards, I shouldn't have said that. I'm not talking about cussing somebody out with foul words, but we can have a mean spirit at times, can't we? We can hurt people's feelings and, 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 and that happens. And yeah, there may be things going on in our lives and maybe you're just so much just going on and you're bothered and all that. No excuses, right? Your hands are still defiled, your feet are defiled, you need a cleansing from God. And by the way, if you're a genuine child of God, when you sin, it'll trouble your heart, and you'll know it. You'll know, I shouldn't be doing this. This is wrong. I need to be clean. I know I've got dirty hands. I know I've got dirty feet. I want to be able to go into the presence of God. Isaiah 52, 11 says, Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Those priests that walked into the temple, and they're carrying the censers with the coals and the incense and all of those things in the temple. They had to have what? Clean hands. They had to be washed at the laver in order to be able to serve the Lord. By the way, that laver, when it was instituted and set in place, 
was first of all, there was an act, a sacrifice made, and they took blood off the altar of sacrifice, and they sprinkled it on the laver. The blood was sprinkled where the what? Where the judgment was taking place, on the brass. And then it was anointed with oil. Oil in the picture is a picture of what? The Holy Spirit of God. And we said that the water and the laver are a picture of the Word of God. Now, what's interesting to me, how do we get the Word of God? Holy men of old spoke as they were what? They were touched, anointed, moved by the Spirit of God to give us this Word of God so that we know that we can trust it. It's not just something that some man concocted in his mind. They were moved along by the Spirit of God to give us the precious Word of God. And that Word, again, is used for what? For cleansing. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, according to your Word. You need the big bath, and then you need the little one on a daily basis. You remember John 13, where Jesus gathers those disciples there in the upper room, and he takes a bowl of water, and he puts a towel around his waist, and he goes to each one and gets down by their feet, and he what? He washes their feet. Do you remember what Peter said? Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And the Lord said this, but Peter, Peter, if you don't let me wash your feet, you can't have any what? You have no part. You have no fellowship with me unless you got clean hands, clean feet. Peter. And Peter says, Lord, then dump the whole bowl on me. <laughs> I want the bath. And Jesus said, no, you don't need the bath. You got the bath. But you need the daily cleansing, the daily washing of your hands and feet. If you're going to serve God, if you're going to have fellowship with God the way that God wants you to live in fellowship with him so that you're not out there trying to minister and really having a ministry of death instead of life. For a preacher like myself to go out and live in sin all week and stand in a pulpit and preach the word of God will never produce life. It'll produce death. So it's incumbent. Pray for me that daily I'll what? I'll experience that cleansing power of the word of God and be able to stand here as a clean vessel, not because I'm a great guy, but because God is still working in my life. I'll never be perfect this side of heaven but God's still working on me. Pray for God to continue to work, and I'll pray for God to continue to work on you, that you'll have the wisdom to get in the Word and receive the daily cleansing from the Lord. It is so important. Picture this. About five years ago, I had some major surgery. They wheeled me into the operating room, and I'm laying there, and, and I looked over, and there's the doc, and I've got to tell you, his hands were filthy. How many of you think I was really excited about him sticking his hands inside of me? He would have been a minister of what? Of death to me. I was so happy when I looked over and he's there at a basin and there's some hot water and he's got some soap and he's scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing. And then he puts on the gloves and he approaches me with what? With clean hands. Listen, if you're ministering and serving God in some area of this church, you owe it to the people that you're ministering with, whether it's the ladies' ministry, down in the nursery, whether you're a deacon or a, a, a board on the board of directors, you're on the missions committee, you teach a Sunday school class, you work in Awana, you work in Surge, college and career, whatever your ministry is, and I'm sorry if I missed one, but whatever your ministry is, can I beg you, do it with clean hands and clean feet. Get yourself cleansed from the filth and the defilement of this world. Take steps. You ought to have it in your heart. I'm not going to watch certain things on TV. Why? Because I'm serving God, and I want to do it with clean hands and clean feet. I'm not saying you can't ever watch TV, but you ought to have some discernment about what you watch. There ought to be that in your life. You ought to do some scrubbing, <laughs> right? Go home, get a toothbrush, clean the dirt out from your fingernails, from your teeth, whatever. Clean yourself up before God. Because God wants, what is it? He wants a clean vessel. Come to God with clean hands and serve the Lord. And can you believe that? I'm only about one minute past seven. I hope nobody drops over from a heart attack because this has never happened before. This may have been, you may not have thought so, 
This may have been one of the most important messages I've ever preached here. If we want God's word to go forth with power, if Jeremy wants to have an outreach and, a, and an impact upon the lives of our teens, he needs what? He needs a bath. He's already had that. He needs what? A daily cleansing in the laver. And by the way, sometimes you need it more than once, don't you? I wash my hands before I eat breakfast. I wash them before I eat dinner. I wash them again before I have supper. I, I wash my hands, I don't know how many times a day. Every time I go to the washroom, I wash my hands. We need that in the Word constantly. You need at least that one time you're going to go to the laver, the Word, and wash. But you need it constantly through the day. That's why it's important you memorize Scripture. You can take it with you. Just run it through your mind. It has a cleansing effect. I, I tell people, think of your mind as, as this vast room, and it's got all these corridors and hallways in this building, and people go in there and write graffiti and all kinds of nasty things on there, and you need the Word to go through there and what? Just scrub the walls. Clean out your mind and your heart. If there's pornography in there, ask God to take the Word and wash it off the walls and cleanse your mind so you're not constantly thinking about it. Seek the cleansing of God. Use the labor and see its importance in your life on a daily basis. Let's bow for a closing word of prayer, shall we?